And uh, this is work, uh, joint work with my colleagues at Microsoft Research, some of whom are no longer at Microsoft Research. <laughs> so this talk is about Surround Web, a 3D web browser that brings immersive experiences to the web. We've designed Surround Web explicitly to make these experiences possible while mitigating important privacy concerns inherent to these experiences. But before I can explain Surround Web, uh, let me show you what immersive experiences actually are. So I'm beginning this presentation with a brief video uh, about Microsoft HoloLens as it illustrates a new way to render applications that we call immersive experiences. Immersive experiences mix digital and real world objects to create rich computing experiences. These applications can display content that responds intelligently to the user's physical environment and can be interacted with in natural ways. For example, in the video, the modeling software intelligently overlays digital content over an actual motorcycle and allows the user to modify the model in a natural manner. Similarly, this user is uh, in a Skype video chat and the video chat follows her around. And finally, this user is playing Minecraft and you can see that the digital blocks intelligently overlay physical surfaces and he can modify the digital uh, village with his hands. And the video goes on to show other experiences and scenarios where digital and physical contents uh, content interact and intersect. So now imagine that HoloLens has an immersive web browser that lets web pages display content in the room, much like the applications you saw in the video. This is not such a crazy leap. Smartphone web browsers have grown in maturity to encapsulate many of the features that native applications enjoy, including camera access, vibration control, and device orientation events. So I believe that platforms like HoloLens will eventually see an immersive web browser. The thing is, uh, HoloLens is not yet released. And I want to make it clear that, like Jon Snow here, I know nothing about HoloLens. I have never used one, never developed for one, or seen one in person. So please don't take anything I've said in this talk as an indication of HoloLens's capabilities or limitations. Instead, during this talk, I'll be talking about an immersive web browser in the context of a single room equipped with projectors, displays, and connects, all working in harmony to produce an immersive experience. So this is the setting in which Surround Web operates. In the paper, we consider a wide range of immersive experiences and scenarios that can be supported using Surround Web. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on a single karaoke application to illustrate the privacy challenges associated with these experiences. So immersive karaoke on the web might sound a bit far-fetched at first, but so does real-time video chat that uses facial recognition to intelligently superimpose mustaches and birthday hats on people. And that already exists in Google Hangouts, which, by the way, I want to mention, now works without any plugins whatsoever. So the web has long been a vehicle for novel experiences, so immersive karaoke isn't out of the question. Returning to our room, let's launch this karaoke web application. After selecting a song, the web page displays a music video on the TV, such as a video of Queen frontman Freddie Mercury. It'll put the lyrics on the wall using projection mapping. And then using a ceiling-mounted projector, the web page will display a playlist on the table that supports interactions via connect gestures. And then maybe it'll project some crowd shots on the wall to cheer you on. And maybe if you had some snacks in the room, it can supply you with nutrition information so you can make informative karaoke time snack choices. And all of this sounds pretty cool, but to make all of this work, this immersive karaoke web page running in this new web browser needs to somehow orchestrate multiple display devices and sensors together in concert. How can we do this while maintaining some level of user privacy? You can imagine just simply granting the page access to all these sensors and display devices through JavaScript, but this poses serious privacy concerns, as these rich sensor streams can contain sensitive incidental data, such as that embarrassing I love PHP mug you secretly own, or the label on the prescription drugs you have in the room. As a next step, you could imagine filtering the sensor stream to remove sensitive incidental data, but there are issues here as well. First, the karaoke page must construct its own rendering support atop this data, preventing interoperability with existing GUI and DOM APIs. 
And second, if a web application wants to support natural user interactions like the playlist that we showed, it will need to track the user's movements from the sensor stream to detect those gestures, which would reveal other information like the user's height, the location, maybe the user's weight in the room. And so there's a clear tension here between functionality and privacy. So how can we give immersive web pages the ability to detect gestures and render content intelligently while maintaining some notion of user privacy? Our answer was a set of new abstractions which we implemented in a 3D web browser, like I said, called Surround Web. And these abstractions are a core contribution of this work. But before we designed those, we had to answer a related question. What are users' privacy attitudes anyway in this type of environment? And going into this work, we didn't know, so we turned to user surveys. We deployed an online survey using the Instantly service to 50 people. And we wanted to understand their privacy attitudes in a variety of scenarios, so we presented them with three wildly different applications. So a dance game, a 911 assist game, and a media player application. We explained immersive experiences to them and asked them what information they would be comfortable sharing with three different applications. So we presented each piece of information that they could optionally present graphically in the context of an example room, which you see in this picture, uh, to drive home the mapping between the information and data and the things in their physical environment. And the list of information included the face with no location information attached to it, the position of the left and right hand, the position of the head, the entire body's position, the location of all of the large flat surfaces in the room, which we've highlighted in, in blue and green here. And finally, those same large flat surfaces, except without any location information whatsoever, just their size and orientation. And from this survey, and a second survey we describe further in the paper, we made the following two important discoveries. First, users have different privacy attitudes toward different applications. So for example, many survey participants were willing to release more information to the 911 application because they were comfortable with emergency personnel having access to it. Um, but they also thought creatively about how other programs could use the information. So for example, the movie player that I talked about they thought that it would be a cool idea, or one person thought it would be a really cool idea if it used your head position to migrate content closer to you in the room. And these results suggest that an immersive web browser should have fine-grained permissions for different sorts of data. Second, users view the location of the large flat surfaces in the room, which you saw highlighted, to be less sensitive than just the raw data, which suggests that revealing the surface information to application to, in exchange, make immersive rendering possible in the first place might be a good way to balance privacy and functionality. From contemplating the survey results and considering a wide variety of immersive experiences, which you saw in the list in the beginning of the presentation, we came up with three main privacy properties that we view are important in this area. And I recommend looking at the paper for a more thorough explanation of each. So detection privacy means that an application can customize its layout based on the presence of an object in the room, but the application never learns whether the object is present or not. We want to make functionality like the karaoke snack calorie counter possible, but without the karaoke application knowing your unhealthy eating choices. Rendering privacy means that an application can render content into a room but it learns no information about the room beyond an explicitly specified set of properties needed to render. We want to let the application display lyrics on the wall while constraining the set of directly and indirectly learnable information to a known set of data about the physical environment. And finally, interaction privacy. Oh, the, the notes are out of sync. One second, there. Okay, and finally, interaction privacy lets the karaoke application display an interactive playlist without, for example, tracking you around the room as you interact with it. And ensuring that our abstractions uphold these properties in a 3D web browser can be surprisingly non-trivial, especially given side channels. And we discussed many of those challenges involved further in the, in the paper, which I highly recommend you look at. 
So given these properties and the information learned through the surveys, we designed SurroundWeb, a privacy-preserving 3D web browser, and the abstractions it encapsulates. Returning back to this previous diagram, SurroundWeb adds new rendering abstractions to the browser that make immersive web pages possible while mitigating some privacy concerns. So it, the abstractions sit between the sensors and the display devices and the application itself. And to expand this a bit, SurroundWeb augments the DOM with a room skeleton and an object detection sandbox. Like CSS, these abstractions control where and how DOM content should be displayed, except in SurroundWeb they determine room placement. At a high level, you can think of the room skeleton as absolute room placement and the detection sandbox for relative room placement. Let's see how these two abstractions can be used to bring the karaoke web page we talked about earlier to life. So here's the room from earlier. Uh, SurroundWeb will use connects in concert with display devices to scan the room and determine renderable surfaces. The end result is the following information, which is incorporated into the room skeleton. Each of these colored boxes we call a screen. Each screen has four pieces of information associated with it. Its location in the room, its physical size, its resolution, and a list of standard DOM events that it supports. To be explicit, the karaoke web page does not see the room at all. It only has access to the screen information. This is the room skeleton. Now, if you, call, if you recall, the web page wanted to display a music video on a TV. Using the room skeleton, it can check the resolution of all of the horizontal surfaces in the room, because naturally a TV is going to be standing up. And it will place it on the one with the highest resolution, which is that 1080p display. The lyrics should go on some horizontal screen above the high resolution display. And so the karaoke application can simply use the screen's location information in the room to determine an appropriate location. So it'll put it on this orange one above the TV. The interactive playlist should go on some surface that supports input events. The karaoke web page can query the room skeleton and see which screen supports input events. And of the screens in the room, only the table is in range of the Kinect sensor for gesture recognition which SurroundWeb will translate into standard mouse events. Thus, the karaoke application will simply place the interactive playlist there. And then finally, for the remaining screens it has not issued content to, it can just put crowd shots up there. So since the room skeleton is high level and integrates with the DOM, the amount of code needed to display everything described so far is pretty minimal and fits on this slide. And also, this is what it actually looks like running in the prototype. But we are forgetting about one thing. What about that snack calorie counter? The web page needs to know when recognized snacks are in the room without knowing if the snacks are there at all. That's where the detection sandbox comes in. The detection sandbox lets applications place content relative to physical objects in the room without revealing the object's presence or location. As a corollary to this, content in the sandbox is non-interactive. The web page uses CSS to specify constraints that reference objects by name. Shouldn't an object detector within SurroundWeb detect the specified object in the room, SurroundWeb will asynchronously solve the constraints for a rendering location. The end result in this example, which you can see the code for, uh, when a Coke can is placed onto the table, its calorie information appears below it. The web page receives no callback when content in the detection sandbox appears in the room. And also, to prevent side channels on the server, SurroundWeb will eagerly, eagerly render every content in the sandbox to prevent the server from detecting an object by, say, an image get request or something like that. And I, I do recommend that you take a look at the paper for further details on side channel mitigation and other things that we considered. So with that piece in place, the calorie information will appropriately appear below the Coke can in the room. And then in the prototype, this is what it looks like. So to briefly recap all of that, I presented SurroundWeb, a 3D web browser that enables immersive experiences while mitigating important privacy concerns. SurroundWeb augments the web platform with two new rendering abstractions that integrate into HTML and CSS. And I highly recommend that you read the paper, just as it contains many more details that I did not have time to mention today such as satellite screens and further information on the privacy properties. And while we get to questions, I want to start a silent video that shows off the prototype in action, displaying many of the applications that we consider in the paper. 
Thank you all for your attention. Thanks very much, John. Uh, does anybody have any questions uh, regarding Surround Web? Uh, okay, so I have, I have a couple. So uh, did you consider any other test applications relatively deeply besides the karaoke one? Um, so pretty much all of the ones that we listed in a table in the, in the paper, we thought through all of them and what, what would be required to, to like create them in Surround Web. So pretty much if you look at all of those, we, we thought them through, even though we didn't have space in the paper to explicitly discuss every single one of them. Can you give us a highlight reel of what those are? Uh, let's see. There was one, I, I forget if it made it to the paper, there's one uh, that's mentioned in this video that in a kitchen would display recipe information on like a, 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 by a stove and would warn you if burners were hot or stuff like that using the detection sandbox by detecting that information. Cool. Uh, so. Did you, when you, when you did the survey with the users, did you verify that they understood this new abstraction? So in the survey, for every single answer that they gave, we asked them why. They, we asked them to justify their answer, and I looked through all of them to, to make sure that they roughly understood what we wanted them to understand. For the most part, most of them understood it, but naturally there were some people who were confused. Oh, cool, cool. And then, so I, I had one uh, final question. So, I really like the, the detection privacy abstraction, but I feel like there probably would be some compelling use cases that uh, would be prevented by that. Were there any things that you wanted to do, but like, oh, Absolutely. detection privacy just will prevent it from happening? Yeah, so we were looking for the set of abstractions that you could just give to any web page for the most part. Um, people would be comfortable with it. But as a result, yeah, we naturally do limit the, the range of applications and types of experiences that we can support. So yeah, in the future, it would be great to allow stuff in the detection sandbox that supports interactions, maybe using a trusted intermediary or something like that. Um, but at, at the moment, um, we don't have uh, anything for that right now. Cool, thanks. We have a question at the center mic. Yeah. Um, in, in general, um, do you think that um, if it were possible to pre-place huge volumes of data, which doesn't seem absolutely impossible the way we're going, would, would that mitigate most of the problems? If you actually didn't have to make web accesses to, to find out most of this information, it were just pre-placed um, on, on your devices. What do you mean by pre-placed? Well, um, just imagine as a Gedanken experiment uh, that the uh, web archive were, were just distributed through some sort of tree all the time so that, that people already had all product information um, on their, uh, in their home or on their personal device. Okay, so you're saying that if, if the person already, I, I'm a little confused, so the, the issue that we're dealing with is that there's data about your environment that you don't want the, the web page or the server knowing. Um, what are you advocating for or suggestion? I, I, I'm wondering, do we, in the future, or do we actually need servers? That's a pretty deep question. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to drinks. say. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Our phones are getting pretty powerful, but there's always going to be some, like servers connect us to other devices. So unless everything goes peer to peer and then you don't need servers, uh, I think they're here for a while. Well, let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you all.